Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode? In today's episode, we are going to be talking about Mary Kay Thompson Tatro's phase theory. And that's a lot to say. We're going to talk about how the hell (laughs) we can get women into history class. I love this. Let's get into it. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%, the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. All right, Brooke, today we're going to be talking about the phase theory, uh, which came out in, I believe, 1986. So... The year you were born. That is me. That is how long this theory has been in place. Hey, Um, great things happen in 86. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, Mary Kay Thompson Tatro wrote this phase theory. It was an expansion of Gerda Lerner's 1975 essay on basically the systematic ways that historians can start to get women's history into what they produce. and. I think this is this theory is sort of the foundation to my book, which is coming out. And uh, I feel like this is like you took it and then made the Eckert test like two point. <laughs> yeah, I mean the Eckert test is a version of the. It actually fits really nicely into one of her phases, and which is where I think we should be at now. But I think a lot of teachers, and I'm thinking about you know some of our listeners who are who work in museums, um, mm. people who you know work you know for a company, and maybe they do some like promotion of women's history stuff. This, I think, really anybody who touches the history world could use this theory. If yeah. you if you write textbooks, if you are an author, you know that sort of thing. Any of this can can kind of apply to your work. And then for everybody like yourself, you know, you work in HR. I wouldn't put you in the category of any of the people that <laughs> I'm weird <laughs> that I just mentioned. But for people like you, this is a systematic way that you can start to undo your male the male centrism of the history that you think you know so and i think people who are listening to us i think they have pretty much just accepted that um our history that we know is male centric before we get into that i think we need a little business update pause yeah so i feel like we need like a World news now, business update. Business update. From the desk of Brooke and Kelsey. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, it is, you know, giving season right now, and we are just so excited to be. <laughs> it like still feels like summer in my mind. So when you just said giving season, I'm like, oh, fall. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're it's, wearing a sweatshirt. Like, <laughs> I mean, you have a turtleneck on. I get it. We're here. But I'm sad about it. <laughs> Anyways, but it is giving season. And I think that um, we've done a really incredible job of trying to get the resources that we make out for free. And what I think a lot of people don't realize is that behind the scenes, that means there's a lot of people supporting the work and giving to it. And either through their time, through their energy, through their resources, and then of course financially. And I think about you know the we thousands. Have like a small army, yeah, <laughs> these amazing worker bees, yeah, that just come in. They're like, I got it. Here's this. Do that. Here's the, the. and yeah. then all the honey comes out. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Um, and and just like the breadth of the project, you know, we've got people from <clears throat> sea to shining sea working oh on gosh. this work. Global. And- it's still global. Like we've been global since year one. Yeah, we're in year three yep and end of year three end of year three i mean so impressive how widespread this is i mean i I think you were saying was this like a week ago they're like oh yeah australia they have this many downloads i'm like what (laughs) yeah yeah no i know and it's it's really it's really special but it's hard to do that without that financial support and we're in this like amazing critical moment where we can actually grow. And my, you know, my vision is that any social studies teacher who goes to a conference for history, for, um, you know, for social studies, for pedagogy, there's an option at that conference to learn about women's history and our resources are like in their hands. That's my dream. Um, And it's really special getting to those conferences. Like we went to NCSS last year. It's, you know, astronomical to get there in terms of cost and but it was so rewarding because within an hour we had handed out hundreds of lesson plans and you left empty like that does not happen I left to empty conference hour table one. goers I didn't, I didn't realize like 
how much people wanted this stuff. And I, I brought, you know, what I thought, like hundreds of lesson plans. And I was like, that's enough. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Like thousands is where yeah. my brain needs to be at. So, and that was really neat. And and since that conference and, and as we've been go- getting bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, we can see the number of people going to our website to download yeah. resources. And they're... Well, and the patrons increase. We've been getting more and more people. It's like, there's a lot of ways that people can get involved without spending their time, but yeah. they can offer their money or in-kind donations of their time. And there's a lot of ways. And so the patrons, oh my gosh, we're so lucky for them. I know. There's so many of you. I know. It's really, really special. So the best way that you can give and support us is at remedialherstory.com slash giving. Um, you can make a monthly donation there. Um, you can also make an annual donation. So if you're like, I don't, yep. I don't want to, you know, see this every month or deal with that. You can set it up to, you can sort of choose your, choose your challenge. (laughs) Um, You can uh, do that. You can also, um, through that, that same resource, you can become a fundraiser for us, which is also really nice. So that's Um, something new that, that, um, the fundraising and you can, many of you follow us on Instagram already, but, um, there's an option on there to do that. And it's been incredible. So many people kicking up small fundraisers, especially, you know, in this season of giving that you're talking about, it's been really, really kind of people to take their time to do that. And, you know, I field questions all the time, like, can men be a part of this? Can men support this? We need men. That's how this gets off the ground. I'd love to talk about Christian Burdo, who is one of our patrons who has supported us since the very beginning. Thank you, Christian. He's amazing. Mark Breyer, also, he's my former high school teacher, (laughs) um, but he supports us. Um, so there, you know, and those are just two of many men who support us. And um, I'm just really grateful to them. Um, and you can see a list of our monthly patrons down at the bottom in the footer of our website. Um, because so, they really are what makes the world go around for us. Like we can do a lot of great things, but financially that supports us so much further. We get so many more things and resources in the hands of teachers and that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can remedialherstory.com slash giving, it'll mean the world to us. Thank you. And that is the end of business update. Business update. Back to your (laughs) regularly scheduled programming. Yeah. So let's talk about this phase theory. Um, Okay. So there are five phases. Are you ready to wrap your mind around this? All right. I'm going to try. Okay. Phase number one, is male history. It's what we know. It is the history that most of us learn okay. in school. So, anyone listening, you're already there. You're in it. <laughs> Welcome. Male, Welcome. Male You've history. You already completed phase one. Yes. <laughs> Let's make it competitive. Let's gamify it. <laughs> Moving okay. on. Phase two. Phase two. So, a lot of people go, oh my gosh, like, I didn't know, uh, like, about X woman. And then they go, what other women did I never learn about, you know? Oh my God, the face you just made. <laughs> I hope that that's not the face I make when I'm like, hmm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. (laughs) Okay, I have to pause here and just add a moment of personal reflection and growth, which is that I've been in this for so long that when people come up to me and they're like, have you ever heard of Susan B. Anthony? No. She just like cringe, find, gives you the ick. They find out that like I'm, you know, passionate like, about women's, women's history. history. Oh my god. Have you ever met? <laughs> it's like it's like in my field when someone's like they're like, "Oh, do you use LinkedIn?" Get the fuck. Out. <laughs> No, what is it? Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I, I've been a recruiter for a decade. What's LinkedIn? What, what is LinkedIn? How Say does more. It, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's less Susan B. Anthony because I think most and people have heard of her. What's it's, your response, though? It's like, oh, did you just find out about her? Well, Let me show you the world. <laughs> <laughs> but you've been one missing. Thing one thing that's been really hard for me is I wear my emotions on my sleeve. Do you? So, I don't know that about you. Oh, really? <laughs> so to have no reaction when someone's like, have you heard of Alice Paul? I'm like, mm. <laughs> no. <laughs> the yes. other day someone was like, oh my God, have you seen this movie about, and it was like, it was something so general. I was like, yeah, it's like the seventh movie they've made about her. Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. So I think so, it was Amelia Earhart. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> like it was the first time they, I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. But the point being is this is a really important step for people yeah. to realize that. And I, I, the reason Susan B. Anthony and Alice Paul, and those two come up a lot. I don't know why. Well, they're, but, they're kind of the first ones people put in history books when they're like, you know what we should do? We introduce a woman. Yeah. And <laughs> so what's hard about them is they are 
their inclusion as sort of like the token woman mm. is classic compensatory history. So comp- uh, the, I think all of this is to say compensatory history is really important for people because when you're, co- think of it like being disillusioned, right? You're in this world where all things history are male and you're like, oh my God, there was this woman, Susan B. Anthony, who was arrested. Yeah, it's the break your brain moment. Yeah, like b- brain broken. <laughs> and so even though it's like, it's I, I kind of giggle when I get those, I also know that that's like a really important step in the like journey, oh, yeah. if you Find will. Find some kindness, right? Yeah. That's great. Who else are you interested in learning about? <laughs> yeah, right. No, and I also think like exploring those women yeah. with depth, right? Like, like is, go in, go, go in. in, learn about them because each There's of a lot. them, they're, I mean, their their service to the cause of women is decades long. So it's not just like the one thing yeah. in her like two paragraph bio. Very impactful. It's like, read about those women. They're They're incredible. So phase two is compensatory history. And think of it like, you know, a lot of like early history was like big man history, right? So like learn about Alexander the Great and, you know, Genghis Khan and right, like those big yeah. guys. And so compensatory history is essentially doing the same thing. Like who are the greats it's, among yeah. women, right? And okay. like, what does that look like? So, so that's phase two. Yeah, yeah. And that's where you get in like the Queen Victorias and the Catherine the Greats. Right. And I'm feeling pretty good. Okay. Phase one, phase two, we got this. Boom, got boom. This. All right, phase three. So phase three is called bifocal or contribution history so if These you're are like sideline people no so not main characters this is characters. starting to be so bifocal meaning like you're seeing two things at the same time so you you know walk into a museum and they have like a wall dedicated to women in this time period oh, right, and so right. those women are integrated into the narrative so like for example um uh, I went to the m- Museum of um, the American Revolution in Philadelphia, and they had, you know, a whole thing dedicated mm-hmm. to women. But, like, it, it's just kind of weird to, like, segregate the women from the experiences of men because, like, like Abigail Adams is writing letters to to John, to a man, <laughs> you know, like... Musk. Like, Connect dot. N- n- these two <laughs> things should be together, right? Yeah. Like, she like, wasn't just writing to air. <laughs> right. So by focal history, like even though it's kind of funny, it, it is a really important step because this one is, is there are parts of women's lives that are really different from men's lives. And as much as Susan B. Anthony and Alice Paul entered the male world of politics, you know, Catherine the Great and Queen Victoria and all these like all these great women like entered the world of politics um, and and kind of like the male sphere for lack of a better term. There are things going on in the women's sphere of things that don't include men that are also kind of important to that history. And so in this space, people will talk about like women's work, whatever that looks like. And I think one of the fallacies about, women's history is that women's work was distinctly different from men's work. And <laughs> I I kind of giggle about it because like, and I, I would hope that teachers actually like really look into that because what women's work looked like really varied from class to class. Like if you're an elite yeah. woman in most time periods, like you're not working and you're doing more, well. You're doing social work. You're doing social working and networking and that sort of thing. And that is work. It is work. It's a different type of work than labor. In the middle classes, there's this whole idea of like respectability, and and we see that still today. Like how middle class people tend to not swear, but like upper class and lower class people, it's like ingrained in their vocabulary. Interesting. So that like theme of respectability and so doing respectable jobs like being a nurse or a secretary or a teacher well back i mean depending on what time period physician yeah (laughs) yeah and i'm I'm obviously like it's for the people who's like an expert on one particular time period or place like i'm generalizing concepts sweeping it sweeping but you know actually when you get into women's work like giving it some nuance there 
But it also could be like looking at themes like childbirth and child rearing mm-hmm. and how, how those things impacted women, you know, birth rates and death rates, um, maternal death rates. Yeah. That could be something you get into in um, bifocal history because it brings in more of the narrative. It brings in more of the narrative and it's really looking at the women's experience and things that men, you know, like men might be devastated by the loss of their mother or spouse in childbirth, but it's really different to like look at, you know, like even the choice to have children mm. as a woman or not to have children. I think that's where, you know, where you can get it like really getting into what is really going on for women that's distinctly different from, from men. them. Yeah. Um, so that's, okay, so that's phase three. That's phase three bifocal history. So looking at men's stuff and women's stuff kind of in these like separate, you know, it'd be like lenses. Yeah. Separate lenses. So if you're a history teacher and I I do think it's really important, you know, Tetrot's theory, the idea is like, you need to kind of go through all these phases. You can't just jump to the end because it needs to go in order. It needs to go in order. I I can see it builds like as a, as a teacher, it's like, okay, I'm going to introduce this. I'm going to now introduce this. And you're kind of expanding the, the, understanding Mm -hmm. and so each each introduction it's like and we're expanding let's keep going so you're building out the lens yeah i love it okay and 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 so i think you know just like taking a moment of pause and like really registering where you are in Mm -hmm. your journey toward like really understanding women's history um and not just women's history like history broadly right because we talk about how a history without women is not really history it's half the story right so if if you're you're somewhere on this journey between an entirely male centric history and you know the end goal so there's two more phases here let's get to that end goal it might surprise people to learn that the fourth phase not the last phase but the fourth phase is called feminist history and so i think that should give us an insight into the idea that the end goal is not women domination (laughs) right like that's not the goal so we'll get to what the goal is in just a moment but the fourth phase is feminist history and this is where the eckert test fits really perfectly cool but the the key idea here is you can't really do the eckert test until you know the other stuff right okay so um and i i think that is kind of i think there's a lot of people who listen to our ted talk and listen to what the eckert test is and they're very intimidated by it it's hard you're asking people you're challenging people to. well and i'm also challenging them to jump to the fourth phase do you know what i'm saying yeah like like right away yeah and and maybe that's not like well this was built in 1986 we are in 2023 uh we're here we're here let's time to move the night the needle and to that point like barbara who's the chair of our board of directors she always goes i can't believe we still have to talk about this oh my gosh i think (laughs) my mom says it to me all the time she's like we're still fighting the same battle i'm tired yeah (laughs) she's like the baton has been passed twice now (laughs) can we keep going but i also think part of the fatigue that women of that generation feel Mm. Is because if I think if people knew Tetro's theory, they would understand like, oh, it's not just like, cool, I talked about Susan B. Anthony one time in my class, like, check, check, women's history done. It's like, oh, no, 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 honey, that's phase two. Like, that's compensatory history. Yep, you, keep going. Keep going. There's more there. So... Phase four, feminist history, is really looking at the diversity of female experiences. So multiple, multiple women's lenses multiple, in the same time frame. Yeah. Multiple. You have the best example for this when we did the Eckert test um, for our TED Talk. Yeah. Do you want to introduce those at all? Well, yeah. So, I mean, there's a there's so many, right? But just thinking about, like, if you take an Alice Paul and you say, okay, so Alice Paul, like, and I think this is the phase four is where you really interrogate compensatory history, yeah, right? Yeah, you're like, was oh, this true? Yeah. Can, can, or should we bring in more lenses? Mm-hmm. Do we need more experiences? Yeah. And then you bring in Alice Paul. Yeah. So you say, like, yeah, let's take Alice Paul, for example. You know, she's this... um radical and i think one of the things that's funny about compensatory history is that it's often very radical women well, get into history class right and, well if they're not loud no one writes it down right <laughs> <laughs> so um 
So you take someone like Alice Paul and you say, okay, cool. Like she's significant, important. Then you take what you learned in your bifocal research that like, oh, okay. So most women were doing this and this is the type of work that women were doing and da, da, da. And then you look for women who are not doing that. Right. And, and challenging that. And so, you know, I take, I think taking someone like an Alice Paul and contrasting her with an anti suffragist yep. um, and finding anti suffragists from multiple class classes too. Yep. Like there are elite women who are anti suffrage because hell, the patriarchy is working for them. So like, why would they be against yep. it? Um, right. Like that's great. Well, they uh, play, they game the system. They oh, like, yeah. No, no, no. I'm at the top. Yeah. Leave it alone. Leave me alone. <laughs> I literally have servants and everyone to do everything for me. And I, and I to sleep travel in. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and, I, and I don't have to see my children. But then there's also women like who are anti suffrage and they're coming from the bottom rungs because they're like, what do I, what the shit do I care about a vote? Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm trying, trying to eat. I'm trying to eat. I'm trying to work. I'm trying not to burn in a factory fire. Like, yeah. you know, like these I are things I don't have time for your bullshit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Right, right, right. So I think so. Sort of looking at at those sort of things, um, but then I, you know, like so you can class it. I think that's a really helpful thing. You can look at even suffragists who are alongside Alice Paul from various classes. Well, and you can globalize it too. You mm-hmm. can look at Alice Paul in her time period. Then you go to the UK. You can go. Yeah, to contrast her with like the Pankhursts from yep, the same exactly. time period. Um, you know, New Zealand is the first country to give women the right to vote. Australia. So like look at some of those suffragists. Very, who, like very progressive they're, countries. They're going around the world meeting with people like the Pankhursts. Tell, yeah, telling and, them. And bringing them Come on. with us. Yeah, join us. So um, yeah, New Zealand, Australia, like they deserve a lot of the credit for globalizing suffrage. So, you know, looking looking at that and then what about like race, right? And especially in the U.S. So bring in people like Mary Church Terrell. Ma- bring in people like Ida Wells well, you Barnett. Have tons of indigenous stories as well. Yep. You, you, like during this time period of like, we've been suffering for years and no one gives a shit. Why do we care about you now? Right. I mean, <laughs> indigenous people, Chinese people in America didn't even have the right to um, to be citizens, right? So like the vote is a is like even further yeah, down like, the go line away. for them. Yeah. So, there, I mean, there's a cool girl from, I want to say she's from San Francisco and she, California, I know she's from California. I think it's San Francisco, but she um, is a teenager, Chinese, you know, immigrant girl and her family are immigrants. She was born here and she's like, I'm an American. Give me the right to vote. Yeah. You know, so she's a, a really important suffragist. She's a teenager. Like she sees it as a teenager. So bring in kids too, right? Like oh, yeah. that sort of narrative. I love, I love when you can bring in peer perspective to Mm -hmm. a teenager like oh this is a 14 year old this is a 14 year old could you imagine taking this step at your age doing this thing Mm -hmm. it does always i remember when my teachers would do that and i'd be like well i've done nothing with my life thank you (laughs) be over here but it was always a good perspective of like you can change things from where you sit right okay so that's phase four yep that's phase four and i mean that's a lot of like where where we've been right like that's what we're talking about in in our pod in our TED talk, um, a lot of the things on our podcast. And for this phase, this is, this is from Tatro. She says, what were most women doing in a particular time in history? Um, what new categories could we be adding? So like, that's where you get into like the race, the class, the, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, what kinds of productive work? So this would be like paid things that women are contributing to the economy. Um, so you can, you can look at that. Um, and then I think, you know, and then she, this is where she asks some of the stuff that we already mentioned, like, how did the variables of race, ethnicity, social class, even marital status, that's something we haven't talked about, mm-hmm. like how prideful women were in being Mrs. John somebody, oh, right? Yeah. Like, because that was a status symbol. But it also was the goal of their lives and they had won the game. Yeah. <laughs> like the goal is to marry well, marry high yeah. and, and take home the gold. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like. And they did it. Mm -hmm. And so, like, in that, in those moments, they were successful. And I think that, you know, bringing in marital status at this stage, too, really helps kind of understand these women well, it's better. Privilege. It's understanding privilege, too. But also, like, Alice Paul, Susan B. Anthony, like, never married. Yeah. Like, that's interesting. And they're, like, the two most iconic women. Like, talk about know, compensatory like- history. They're, like... F the whole system. Yeah, like, I'm not going to be tied to one man. (laughs) Yeah, and they're (laughs) the women we learn about, right? Yeah. And it gets to, you know, um, 
Thatcher Ulrich's um, well-behaved women oh, seldom yeah. make history, right? Like those two women didn't behave. And yet alongside them, you've got people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was married and did have a million children and <laughs> was had a Mr. supportive husband. Yeah, had a supportive, well, sort of husband, right? Yeah. You know, and so I think like bringing in that status to look at differences between women and help. I think this stage, this feminist stage is all about like not making women a, a monolithic group. Yeah, singular. Right? One They're, note. Right. And I think we know that about men because men get the chance to be diverse mm-hmm. in history. And we get to learn about a lot of different men. Perspectives. With different and perspectives. And, yeah. Yeah. And, okay. So yeah. phase four. Phase five. Five. So we've made it is, to the mountaintop. We have made it to the mountaintop. You've learned all these things. You understand the diversity of Be women. Be so proud of yourselves, guys. You are crushing it. But that's not the goal, right? The goal is not to like turn your whole history class into straight up women's history. No. Because like most of us fell in love, who've dedicated our careers to like teaching history mm. or like working in a museum or whatever, or writing books, like... Yeah. It's not that we don't love men. Like, I fell in love with male history. You know, like, I'm yeah, obsessed. It got with, you in. I'm obsessed with World War II. I'm obsessed with Lincoln. Like, I could spend my lifetime writing books about Lincoln. Like, he's so awesome. <laughs> That's not the end. Yeah. Right? Like, the end is not, okay, so we shift. And in fact, like, that feminist history stage still kind of feels bifocal, right? Where you're uh-huh. like talking about women's diversity and, and like, but where do men fit back into that bit? And the end goal is a holistic history. So phase five. So you bring it all together. Is integrated history. And I think that is the part where I'm at in my teaching is trying to figure out how to do that now. I think that's most of our listeners who are educators are like, inclusive history. How do I do it? And how, how do I do, do I- it well and uh, make enough people, you know, because you're, you're like, okay, if I say, here's all the lenses, I want seven lenses, <laughs> I want race, ethnicity, creed, <laughs> yeah. like all the things. And then for you're like, men and women, for men and women, you're yeah. like 45 people. I have 15 minutes, <laughs> you yeah. know, you like break yeah. it down. You're like, and I'm overwhelmed immediately. And yeah. I'm just going to go back to the book. <laughs> right. And I think like, I think that's where a lot of people, and you know, most textbooks are still in bifocal, like the most progressive textbook I can find for world history. It's called ways of the world. And I say progressive in a, like they're trying to do this. Yeah. When you did the, um, the textbook analysis. Yeah. So a while ago, for those who are new to the podcast, Kelsey did this project with some of her students where they went through and documented several different history textbooks and, and how many times women were mentioned. Yeah. And that project was was really eye opening. (laughs) Yeah. It was like one to four. And so rate of men. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you could take that project and run with it and like score textbooks for days, but so this is a progressive one in your mind. It's good because every <clears throat> single chapter makes an effort at the bifocal level to talk about women and okay. their experiences. So if we take the perspective as history educators that, okay, the history textbook is a bi, it starts at the bifocal phase. Yeah. Now I need to build feminist and holistic. Yeah. Right. Right. So like if you're using that textbook, okay, so they're saying this is true for women. Like, can you find exceptions to that and bring it in? So then you can yep. get yourself to <clears throat> feminist what stages and then the trick is like integrating it so we've been talking about suffrage a lot so i think we should stay on that theme and like okay so where does suffrage fit into male history right because it like it is actually really important to the history that we traditionally teach and for people like alice paul i think you need to center her in time and put her alongside other men part of the reason she's so controversial is that she's protesting a president who's at war it's world war one so you can't teach about alice paul without also talking about the patriotism and the feelings that americans had in world war one Right. Like this sense of like, these guys are and guys. I mean that literally these sailors are like getting on boats and they're going to go die in a trench and you have the audacity to stand outside and protest the commander in chief. (laughs) Right. Like that's how people thought about her in her time. And, 
And it's legit. And there were many suffragists who, when World War One happened, said, I'm going to be rolling bandages. Like, that's, that's, that's where I'm this at. This is where I fit. How I fit. This is where I fit. And there's some women's diversity right there. You know, yep. like, get into that with them. Um, I also think that you need to center the suffrage protests alongside the labor protests. So, there's a lot of men in particular, but also women, who are protesting the war because it's mostly poor working class men that are who are, suffering, who are fighting and dying in these trenches. And it's elite men like Woodrow Wilson who are sending them to those trenches. And um, so putting, you know, we, this is a time of the, the sedition acts. And when you, when you put her alongside that, like we've got men who are literally going to prison because they're saying, I don't support this war because it's like anti-working class men. And the solution that Woodrow Wilson and his government come up with is put these people in jail. Like the, yeah. it's like the antithesis of free speech. So then you look at how these guys, these labor activists um, are going to jail under the alien and sedition acts. And, you now see Alice Paul going to jail, right, for protesting. And, you know, she's going to jail on, like, a trumped-up, like, blocking traffic is the thing, right? And I think it she makes a lot more sense. The situations that she's in make a lot more sense. And even though the issues they're advocating for are, are really different, it's all happening at the same time. And yeah. so you can't segregate her from the things that are going on with men. You have to put her in with men otherwise it doesn't tell the whole narrative if you leave it out so yeah that makes sense and it doesn't really make sense like why are people so it's not just that they're anti-suffrage right? right it's that they're anti being against the commander-in-chief in wartime yeah right? which is dangerous dangerous yeah. very dangerous so this this last stage is holistic. It's yep. all of us together. And you know, we use the term herstory to describe what we're talking about with women's yeah. history and we contrast it with his story, right? Which is what we know. Mm -hmm. That's phase 1 male centrism, right? And actually, you know, fem if we take if we think of feminism as the the fourth stage as her story, the fifth stage is not her story. It's yeah. our story. Yeah, exactly. All of us, all of us together. And telling it inclusively and that includes men it includes how all these conflicts you know are conversations about actually like masculinity and femininity and what that looks like yeah, all the dynamics of a lived experience yeah i think it's really it would be a fun exercise in a classroom to give kids each one of your students one of these phases and be like okay we're going to talk about this topic you go do this you go do this you go do this, and then bring it all together and it's like this this team presents the feminist view this team does the bifocal this team like what a fun exercise of investigation and curiosity and deepening their understanding and then bringing it all together and teaching each other yeah I, I could see that being really neat or even using it as like a cr criteria to examine exactly. sources. Well, um, I think a lot of our lesson plans that are available have this already done <laughs> because yeah. we use the Eckert test. But I also think you could break any of your current lesson plans and help build those in as well. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, you know, this is the these five phases um, are essentially the chapters of my book is like oh, hey. breaking that down. Um, I expand a little bit on feminist history. Um, I have a couple chapters. Oh, on do that. you? Is that the area you spend a little more time on? A little bit more time. <laughs> Casual. Hey. Um, so, you know, that book's not out yet, but when it comes out, that's, this awesome. is sort of what we're diving into. And to your point, like how to do it, right? Yeah. Like, like get it in there. What does that look like? Um, and in you know, action in action. Yeah. So, Cool. I'm Lisa, excited, Kelsey. Mary Kay Tatrault's phase theory. And thank you to her for coming up with such an easy to digest approach. <laughs> Not to say easy to di digest. Uh, easy to. It's edible. It's <laughs> <laughs> I took a big bite of that. It sounds good. Mm. All right. Well, thanks, Kelsey. Thanks, Brooke. See you next time. See you next time. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.